devices. And now I'd like to introduce our main speaker, Larry B. Thank you, thank you very much. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. I really mean that. This is this is a, a class A meeting, and it's a damn good meeting. And I, um, I appreciate your 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 time and being here tonight, and and uh, boy, asking me to do this. Uh, thank you, you know, so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and uh, to just to come back and see my friends Reg and Jerry and, and Dave, and oh God, you know, you, you you go to different meetings, and all of a sudden you go to a meeting you haven't been to in a while, and you go, God, I see all these people, you know, no, they didn't go out and get drunk, they just go into different meetings. Everybody's staying sober. How nice! I grew up in a shitty section of New Jersey. Right across the river from Manhattan, it was a 20, 20 minutes and 35 cent bus ride to center of Manhattan down by Port Authority, and, and there were some pretty sleazy bars over there, which was pretty nice because they would serve you, and they didn't ask questions about your age and this and that, and the drinking age in New York was 18, and in New Jersey it was 21. So all I had to do was go with my buddies, and then we'd go down by Port Authority and find some sleazy bar, and walk in when we were 16, 15, 17. We'd get, we'd get drunk, and I never drank normally. I, to this, my dad was an alcoholic, my brother was an alcoholic, and I never drank normally. I mean, from the very first time I drank, it was, it was all or nothing at all. It was get it on. I mean, I, and, and I, I loved, I, I identified so much with Julie, with her story, parts of her story, and Alex, that cheap wine. That was one of my favorite things, cheap wine, for two reasons. One is, it, 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 you can't drink it too fast. I mean, if you get some nasty port wine or sweet wine, you drink it, it's got the world's worst hangover, but you can't drink it too fast. The other thing is, when you're drinking it, you know you're drinking it. You know, you know, and that stuff's going down. When, when that's going down your gullet, man, when, when that's going into your, and your whole chest cavity explodes when you drink that cheap wine, you know, and, it's, it, and I did that. I got married my junior year of college, uh, my ex-wife, and then uh, we were married uh, several years, and my drinking kind of stopped, uh, not didn't stop, but, but I didn't drink often, but when I drank, I got drunk. But I didn't drink often, maybe once a month or so, and it was almost tolerable, I guess. And then it was Thanksgiving, 1980. Uh, we were looking to buy our first house. I mean, we got married while we were in college. We were always broke, and I finally got a really good job, and, and things were going good, and we were renting a half a duplex, and, and it was Thanksgiving, and we weren't going to the in-laws or the outlaws or anybody's house for Thanksgiving. We were going to have it home with the kids. And I never did this before, and, 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 and after dinner, uh, uh, Sandy was putting the kids to bed, and I said, uh, you know, was it, uh, before, uh, during dinner, I said, honey, I'd like to say grace before dinner. And she looked at me, she says, okay, if you want. And I said, God, thank you so much. My life is exactly the way I want it. It's exactly the way I always dreamed of it. I have the most lovely wife, and I have the beautiful children, and I got a good job now. And this weekend, we're gonna go look at a, buying a house, our own home, and we won't have to rent anymore. And I feel so blessed, God, thank you so much. And then we ate dinner, and she put the kids to bed, and I was doing the dishes like I did every night after dinner. And she says, Larry, sit down, I gotta talk to you. And I said, sure, what's up? And she says, well, I've had a boyfriend for the last three years, and he, he, he comes over while you're at work, and we've been getting it on, and I really don't love you, and I haven't loved you in three years, and, and it was like the sweet kiss of a wet fist of reality. <laughs> I was like the deer in the headlights to the max. I mean, I was, I was totaled. And, and so I didn't eat for two days. It was on Thursday, Thanksgiving. And Saturday morning, I went down to the canal, the Delaware Raritan Canal. I drove down there, and I stopped on the way, and I got myself what I deserved. It was a nice uh, fifth of Yukon Jack. Yeah, yeah, anybody familiar? It's the black sheep of the, it says right on the label, the black sheep of the whiskey world. <laughs> And it shows some poor sucker in the snow, you know, in the Yukon. <laughs> I, I, I assume his name was Yukon Jack. And I started to consume that thing, and I was walking down, and I was talking out loud and reciting some poetry and talking to myself and angry and hurt and confused. And I woke up 8 o'clock at night shackled, my ankles and my wrists in the psych ward of Somerset Hospital. And I didn't know how I got there. I had no idea. 
And I finally talked the night nurse into bringing me my jacket so I can have a cigarette. And I pulled a pack of cigarettes out and they were soaking wet. I said, why, didn't, why are my cigarettes wet? She looked, she looked at me and she goes, are you crazy? You don't know what happened? You fell into the canal. A car was coming by. They saw you clutching onto a root that was sticking out of the banks. Now, this is November in New Jersey, so the water is probably two to three degrees above freezing. And somebody thought there was a body and it had floated on the side of the, the canal. And so the police came, but they said it was weird because they had to pry my fingers off that root. They were so tight wrapped around the root, the muscles had spasmed around that root. And, and God was with me that day. And it was eight o'clock at night. And that was the beginning of a lot of drinking and bad drinking. And I couldn't cope with my feelings. I moved back in with my parents and every night I'd come home, I'd get drunk. I'd have that little bottle, that flask or whatever, and I'd go to my bedroom and I would just sit there and I couldn't sleep. I had to drink myself till I passed out. Half of the time with a tear in my eye over my, my, my divorce and all. And the company out here in Speron, it was on Archibald and Knight and Cucamongo offered, you know, they offered me a, I was with the company and they said they wanted to transfer me to California. And I'm not sure to this day whether they just wanted to get rid of a headache they had hanging around by the corporate office or uh, that was uh, coming in smelling like booze and having a lot of personal problems or whether they really, I think they needed me out here and, and, I, and so I came out and I came out and I, and, and I said, this is it. I get to start my life new, fresh start, California, yeah. But I'm gonna have to leave my children back in the East Coast, back with my, my ex-wife and I love my children. And at that time, you know, my daughter was about three, my son was about six, and it was a very difficult thing. So I came out, I went for the interview, I accepted the job. I went and checked in down in Orange, down in by Orange at the summer hotel, and I, and I had to go to the other facility. And that night I was sitting there in the room and I bought a big bottle of wine and I was drinking the wine and I was feeling sorry for myself. Oh, I'm going to leave the kids back east, I'm going to be here by, you know? And then I went out. I went out and played bumper cars. I hit a parked car. It was a rental car. I got, I got this. I'm, 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 I'm broke. I, I, you know, we barely had m enough money to make ends meet. I'm going through a bad divorce, I'm totally broke, and I take this rental car, and at about 40, 45 miles an hour, I deposit it into a parked car that was just sitting in this big old parked car. And the uh, next day, the uh, rental agency informed me because I was drunk, it's not covered under the insurance. So I owed $1,800 worth of damage on the rental car, and I owed 900 on the total cost of the, this old beat up car that I hit. And I started going to AA. People recommended it. I knew I thought I needed it. I started going to AA. And I went to AA. And every time somebody would share, they'd say, Oh, you know, I, uh, I lost my job because of drinking. I'd say, oh, I didn't lose my job because of drinking. Somebody would say, oh, I lost my marriage because of drinking. I'd say, I didn't lose my marriage because of drinking. I lost it because she's running around. You know? <laughs> Somebody, gal, would say, gee, I feel so lonely when I'm drinking. I'd say, lonely? I got lots of friends, man. So I sat, and every time somebody shared, I wanted to tell myself how different I was from you guys. I'm not like you alcoholic guys in AA. I'm better than that. I'm, 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 I'm okay. So I went to meetings and I went down to the Triangle Club and Hal Watson became my temporary sponsor and all of this. And I, I wandered. I didn't, I didn't uh, slip. I just wandered away. I just went away. I stopped going to meetings. I occasionally drank. But I, I kept the drinking under wraps for a while, for several years. And I went back to East on the business trip. And I went down to the canal where I was fished out of. And I put my hand on my hips and I said, that was some awful times that I had to get through, but I'm past this. So I went back to California and I informed my wife that, you know, I went down to the canal and I believed that that was just a terrible time in my life. And she said, I believe so too. I think you were going through a bad divorce. And I said, and I don't believe I'm an alcoholic. She goes, I don't think you're an alcoholic either. My husband's not an alcoholic. And I said, it would sure be nice to have like a little glass of brandy or Grand Marnier by the fireplace on a rainy night. <laughs> we 
we've got this nice fireplace, you put the logs in, it's like a freaking commercial, right? <laughs> Grand Marnier, you know, all those commercials, they look so romantic, right? They don't show you somebody getting really totally blitzed and crashing a car or falling down. They just show you the, the, the fireplace, so that's me. I, so I said, you know, it sure would be nice. She said, you know, honey, I don't think it would hurt anything if just once in a while you had a little glass of Grand Marnier or Brandy Mother Fire. We went from that glass of Grand Marnier or brandy by the fire to hiding bottles of super schnapps in the garage. Took a <laughs> it took a month. It took a freaking month. In a month, I had bottles of soup, 100, that's 101 proof peppermint schnapps, and then Smirnoff's Blue Label. And on a hot summer day, man, that's really delicious. You go out to the garage, I got a wooden detached garage that gets up to about 120 <laughs> degrees. And so does, and you know, I was a chemistry major in college. I know that eventually, that the liquid in that bottle will equal the temperature of the garage. You know, we, 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 the heat transfer, it's called, you know? And, 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 and I'd be sweating, mowing the grass, and I'd sneak out to the garage, and I'd go to take a gulp of 100 proof vodka that's about 120 degrees, and it would be burning my throat. I'd be gagging and spitting it up and all. And um, social drinker. Uh, definitely a social drinker. And, 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 and finally, uh, June 16th, 1990 came around. And I went and I gave a talk at the old Red Lion down at Ontario Airport. It was a professional meeting and I was the opening speaker at like eight o'clock in the morning and I gave a talk, a nice talk. And they asked me, you stand for the conference? I said, no, I have things to do. They said, well, thank you so much. That was a good talk. This was two, two, you know, two totally different lives. And I stopped at the liquor store on the way home and I got myself a whole pint of super schnapps because it's gonna be a long day, it's a Saturday. But it's gotta last me all day. And, and the liquor store was at least 10, 15 minutes from my house. Uh, the bottle was empty by the time I got home. <laughs> and I went in the house and I wasn't drunk, but I was miserable. And I was sitting there and my wife wasn't talking to me, my two children weren't talking to me, and my stepchildren. They were in the living room watching TV, my wife was sitting at the dining room table. I walked in and sat down like, and nobody's talking to me. And I said, I can't do this anymore. And I, and I, I I started thinking, you know, because when we're, we're, we're Alkies drinking Alkies, we think crazy. And I said, I got that shotgun in the closet. And my self-esteem was so low at this point. I said, let me go get the shotgun. Let me go into the shower stall, put the, the thing in my mouth, to use my toe, pop the trigger, take the top of my head off, and it'll be an easy cleanup because I'll be in the shower stall and all they have to do is turn on the shower and rinse the, the stuff thing on. And I got up and, and I wasn't fooling. There were no notes. I wasn't looking for attention. I just wanted it to stop. And, and, and I, when I go to recovery house, I always tell people this, you know, if you think, God, if I only had a good job, oh, if I only had an education, oh, if I only had a nice family or a nice husband or a nice wife, if I only had a nice house, June 16th, 1990, I had two cars in front of the house paid for. I was working as a, as a quality manager for a medical device company down in Orange County making good money. I have a degree in chemistry from a reputable college in New Jersey. I got an education, a good job. My wife's a wonderful person. We're still married, but, you know, we just celebrated, what, 33 years of marriage. And, 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 and I had all of that, and I had a nice house, and I had a family, and I had anything. The other thing I had was alcoholism. Dead alcoholic, man. So I got up, sat down, got up, sat down, got up, sat down. And what happened was, in the early days, when I first moved to California, I went down to the Triangle Club, I also went to Sixth and Grove, to the Alano Club. And I thought about it and I said, you know, some of those people were, seemed to be doing well and they seemed well adjusted and happy and normal. I need to go back there maybe. And I said, you know, I'm thinking to myself, do you want to kill yourself? And I'm of Polish descent, which is important in the story because even being of Polish descent, I realized that sequence was everything was that if I went to the Alano Club and, and got involved with AA, you know, that, that's, that's okay, and then I don't kill myself. But if I kill myself first, then I can't go down to the Alano Club. So it was the sequence that was important, was that I try the Alano Club before I kill myself. So I'm sitting there, and all of these crazy thoughts are going through my head. 
And out of nowhere, and I never said this before to my, my wife, I said, honey, I, I got something I need to tell you. And I know you're not talking to me, and I know the kids aren't talking to me, and I know I've been a jerk, and I know I've been a bad person to be married to, and all of this stuff, but I gotta tell you something. I said, I'm a real alcoholic, and I can't control my drinking, and it's got the better of me. And if I don't do something today, as soon as possible, I'm either gonna hurt somebody, either myself or somebody close to me is gonna, I just have this premonition, I know it's gonna happen. Somebody's gonna get hurt or killed or something, and I have to stop right now. So she said, um, she got up and she walked towards me. I didn't know she was gonna hit me or what she was gonna do at this point. But she came over and she hugged me and she started crying and she said, I've been waiting about two years to hear you say something like this. Go get help, please, please. So I got in the car and I went to Sixth and Grove. There's no Milano Club. <laughs> I'm ready to turn my will and my life over to this damn program and you ain't there. So I looked over and I said, wait a second. These people were doing really well. They must have got really well and they just closed the place they didn't need it anymore or something. And I'm driving home and I said, no, that doesn't sound quite right. There's something about that sound. So I called and I found out where it is and it was in Rancho Cucamonga and I walk in the door and I walk in the door and I don't know what to say. I have no idea. My head is going 80 miles an hour. I'm a, thought about killing myself, but I know there's a better life out there. I know things could be okay. Something inside, God inside said, you're gonna be okay, just, just, just hang in. And I got up there and I walk up to the counter and I don't know what to say and Harold Douglas, if anybody remembers old Harold, was behind the counter and he's got his hair parted in the middle down to here and he's got a big Fu Manchu mustache. He looks like an old burnt out biker. And he's got a damn feather for an earring. And he's got his head on his arm and he's sleeping. He's sleeping. I'm over there. So he picks his head up and in a very compassionate, soft way like he was known to be, he looked at me and says, what do you want? And I got scared and I became the, the mouse with the hat in the cartoons. I said, hi, I said, I'm Larry, and I'm having a terrible problem, and I'm an alcoholic, and I need to get help, and I, if I don't get help soon, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know it's really, really bad it's going to happen, and if it doesn't, and I think I need to meet with some people or do something, because I was going to kill myself this morning, but I don't want to kill myself, and he went, whoa, slow down, and he hooked me up with, I think it was Lupe was his name, the fireman or something, Lupe, and, and uh, young uh, Ronnie, and they pulled me in the back, and, and they talked to me, and that was June 16th, 1990, and I haven't had a... Uh, I haven't had to drink or take any pot or to use any drugs or anything since. And I went into the program, and I, next morning I went to my Sunday morning meeting that I still go to at 9 o'clock, and somebody said, you know, I lost my job because of drinking. I said, God, I should have been fired so many times for missing work and for coming in half-loaded and this and that. I should have lost my job for drinking. And somebody said, you know, I lost my marriage because of my drinking. And I said, God, if my wife, my present wife, had done to me what, I had, what I've been doing to her for the last couple of years, I would have gotten rid of her. I would have thrown her out, coming home drunk all the time and this and that. No, 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 no. I should have been lost in my marriage. And somebody says, you know, I'm so lonely. I said, you know, I could be in a party in a room full of people, and I'm so lonely that it eats me up. And I'm tired of the guilt. I was talking to Julie about that. I'm tired of lying. I'm tired of hiding those bottles. I'm tired of stopping at the gas station in the morning and buying $2 worth of gas so I can get rid of my empties that I just smuggled from my house at 6.30 in the morning from the night before. Smuggling and full bottles in and empties out every day was a chore. And I couldn't, and, and when I come home when I've been drinking, I can't even look my wife or kids in the eye. I'm looking down at the ground because I'm ashamed of who I am and who I've become. I've become a monster. And, I, and, I, and I, I just started going to the program. And guys like Jerry, I mean, we had a group down at Matrix. God, it was like we wanted fun, some fun. And we used to, and he, was, he didn't realize what he was getting into. They asked him, I think it was a Tuesday night, Jared, Tuesday night meeting. And, and they asked him to, 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 be, to take over the Tuesday night meeting at Matrix. He didn't realize there was like six newcomers in Jerry.
And he, had a, and he had a few years, and he was babysitting. That's all he was doing. He was saying, "No, you're not supposed to laugh during the reading of the, you know, third step. You know, the, the, you know, you know, no, no, no. You're not supposed to be throwing stuff at each other while we're sharing." And you know, it was just like kindergarten. It was like kindergarten. It was. It was genuinely like kindergarten because you had about five or six total lunatics in this meeting, and he, he did great. If it wasn't for guys like Jerry showing me the way, I wouldn't be here today. And I got the message. And my point about, I sit there and I listen to people share the before, and Alex and, 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 and Julie, and I say, I, I'm just like these, I'm just, I'm one of them. I'm one of you people, I'm, I'm, there's no difference. We're together in this thing, and I belong here. And I thought, you know, for nine years, I thought I was so different than the people in AA that I almost died from terminal uniqueness. I had a, I had a, I had a case, I was so unique, I was so unique, that I was about to die because of my alcoholism, because I had to be so different than you guys. And the answer was, was, was just to shut up and be honest with yourself. Listen and be honest with yourself like I'm doing now. And what a journey it's been. Two years into, two years into the sobriety, and I told you I'm Polish, so it takes a while. Two years, into, two years into, into my sobriety, I was sitting there at a meeting and saying, you know, there's something really different about my life today than it used to be. And I'm, I, I, there's something specific that I'm thinking about, but I can't place it, and it dawned on me. And yeah, I got rid of the second voice. I had gotten rid of the second voice, and it, everything became simpler. Bless you. And everything became simpler. Because I used to, have, I used to drive home from work, and I'd say, okay, Larry, don't stop at the liquor store tonight. You know, your family's waiting for you. You can behave for a change. You can go home and have dinner with the family and behave. The second voice would say, wait a second. You work hard. You pay the bills. You deserve a little drinky drink. There's a liquor store. Why don't you pull into the liquor store? And a good voice would say, Larry, what? Don't go to the liquor store. You know, it's going to be the same thing over and over again. And then the other voice would say, come on, let's go. And then I'd be turning into the second voice always won. It always, it always overpowered the sensible voice. The stupid voice always overpowered. And it said, "Go!" And then I'd walk in the liquor store and say, "Larry, don't get the big bottle. Just get a small bottle if you need something to take the edge off." And I'd look and say, "Wait a second. The small bottle is like two dollars and change, and for three fifty, I can get twice as much." And you don't have to be a mathematical wizard to figure out where the bargain is here. And it's now six o'clock, and it's probably going to be at least two and a half, three hours before I go to bed. And so the small bottle's not going to cover the three-hour gap between walking in the door with your family who's having dinner, and then it's time to pass out. So we need the big bottle. And then I'd get in a car with the big bottle, and I'd be driving home. And it's, please now, Larry, whatever you do, do not start drinking that before you get in your house, because Bonnie's going to smell your breath. You're going to be looking at the ground like you do whenever you drink, and it's going to be trouble and it's all going to start again. So just wait until you get inside, hide it, and then put it in your briefcase or something and drink it later. And then I'd pull up in front of the house and then I did the old, I'd look like I was looking for something under the seat and I would open the cap and I'd be drawing on, I'm drawing, I'm just a sneak drinker, but I'm drawing on the bottle in front of my house like I'm looking for something under the seat and like nobody knows what I'm doing. If, you know, everybody in the world knows that I've got a serious drinking problem and I'm hiding it but I will do anything to hide it. At this point, I will lie, I will go tell you I'm going. Sunday mornings, I'll go get the Sunday, it's the paper, I gotta get buy the paper at the store. So I buy a bottle of that delicious tawny port, I think it was called, white port wine, it's like 20, because it's high octane, it's like 20% alcohol. And I get a bottle of that, and I would drink it in the alley, walking home from the store, from the Circle K to Stop and Rob there, and I, and I would, I'd have this bottle, and I would consume it, then I would go home and pour coffee, and I'd be drinking coffee and, 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 and reading the Sunday paper when the family got up. They didn't know I had like a whole fifth of white port wine in me, you know, and because and, I'm sneaking, I'm sneaking, and I'm guilty, and, I'm t and, and all of a sudden I'm sitting there with two years sobriety, and I said, there is only one voice, and it's a good voice, and it's the one that I listen to. Hey, Larry, what, you're done with work? Why don't you stop at the, uh, at, at the happy hour meeting over at the Alano Club? Hey, honey, it's me. Yeah, what's up? I'm going to go to the happy hour meeting, so it's over at 6.30. I'll actually be home about quarter to seven or so. Okay, I'll have a plate of food for you when you get home. Me and the kids are going to eat. Just put it in a microwave when you get home. And I'd get off the phone and I'd say, 
damn, I'm actually doing and going where I say I'm going, and I'm doing what I say I'm doing. And what a good feeling that is after all those years of making up stories and lying and hiding and drinking and all. And, and, and it's been a trip. It's been a trip. You know, it's, it, it's fun. I, the company sent me over to Israel for, for business when I was with James, uh, some company I can't mention. But when I was with Johnson & Johnson, I was in over in Israel. <laughs> And, 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 and they, had a, they gave me a driver and everything, and a guy picks me up. I said, I, I gotta get down to this, this street here. And he goes, what, what are you trying to find? I said, Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd love to come to go to a meeting. The meetings were in a bomb shelter underground. It looked like a subway stop. You go down these stairs, and he checks to make sure there's no, that it's safe, because that's his job. You know, and he's armed, and he's a bodyguard, and he's, and he's a driver and a bodyguard. And, and, and I go to this meeting, and it's in Hebrew. And I don't speak Hebrew, but, I, but, but it was great. Because I was over in Israel by myself, and I had this nice room and all, but, but when I'm by, you know, when I'm, I'm not meant to be too long in a hotel room by myself. That's a, that's a pretty slick thing. I'm better off, you know, just go find a meeting. I, so I go to the meeting, and, 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 and one of the guys there was Russian. I, I studied Russian in high school and college, and we talked a little, and he invited me to Wednesday night to the Russian meeting. So then I went to the Russian meeting, and they have the whole meeting in Russian, and they're all, and we're underground in a friggin' bomb shelter. And they're all holding their cigarettes like this. <laughs> and they're talking in Russian, and I thought I was in a friggin' World War II spy movie or something. And I'm sitting there, and they do the exact same readings. They do the opening prayer in chapter 3 and chapter 5 and 12, but it's in Russian, you know? And then I have the guy sitting next to me translating, so I had to go back two, more, two or three more times for company business, and every time I would go, I'd go to that meeting, I'd stop at the store, I'd buy some candy, and I'd make some... 60s soul music, you know, it's like Four Tops, Temptations, and I would make C copies of CDs and give them to the people at the meeting because they thought that was really cool and the candy was nice. And, and I, I connected with AA over in Israel in a bomb shelter. What a strange place to be, you know? And then one time I went to Cincinnati and I, I got to the, uh, the airports in Kentucky, Cincinnati airports, across the river in another state. And, and um, I got there on a Saturday night and I was going to meet a friend of mine for, for the next day for lunch or dinner and we were going to hang around and then Monday I had to be there for business over at um, um, Park and Gamble. Um, you know, because I was working for a company that provided them with some stuff. Anyway, I, I, I went up to the desk and I said, you know, I said, uh, I have to get to Edgewood. Uh, is there some way I can get a ride? And the guy said, yeah, uh, the van that goes back and forth to the airport, we can probably take a side trip. And I said, I'll give you a couple bucks. You know, I appreciate it. And then later on, they said, no, they got too busy. They couldn't do it, so they called me a cab. And they said, what are you doing down in Edgewood? There's nothing there. It's Saturday night. It's a little town, Edgewood, Kentucky. There's nothing there. I said, oh, uh, I'll, I just kind of want to go down there. And the address I had was for the friggin' police station. They said, you have relatives here? I said, no. They said, do you have friends down in Edgewood? I said, no. But you want to go to Edgewood? I said, yeah. <laughs> so I go down to Edgewood, but the cab takes me, and lo and behold, this should never happen in California. Too many of you guys have uh, warrants or difficulty with the police. <laughs> they got the AA meeting upstairs from the police department. You park your car in the parking lot at the police station, and you go up the stairs, and it's like the town hall, and it's a big room. And it's, it's a lot of young people from the recovery place. So I go to this meeting, and, and this lady across from me, you know, she, she, she hears me talking, and she leans over, and she goes, Darling, where are you from? I said, from New Jersey. Oh, my God, your voice is like music to my ears. She says, I'm Jewish, and I'm from New York, and I just don't get to hear that good New York accent. And, like, you know, and I said, well, that's nice. So we had the meeting, and after the meeting, she says, Hey, honey, why don't you come with me and my husband? We're going to go for coffee and pie at the little diner down here. And I said, well, I gotta, I'm going to need a ride back to the hotel. She goes, we'll take you, no problem. So we go out, and I got this like brand new Chrysler. I mean, this beautiful car, this big-ass car. And we go and have pie and coffee, and it was a lot of fun. It was good, good. I'm, you know, I'm on my own. I'm not going to be by myself. I, we, they drop me off, they pull in front of the place, and the two guys are at the desk that were asking me, who did I know in Edgewood? <laughs> Not only do I get out of this big-ass Chrysler, which looks a little suspicious, but the lady and her husband get out, and he's not in the program, he just goes there to take care of his drunken wife and make sure she gets to a meeting. 
And, and, and the lady gets out, and in an AA fashion, she gives me this gigantic hug, and she said, Larry, it's been such a pleasure. I said, it certainly has, Rose. I, I really I appreciate it, and thanks for taking me out and all. And I turn around, and these two guys are at the desk, hanging over the desk going, Now, I can't let this slide. This, this is too good a golden opportunity because deep down inside, I'm a fun-loving prankster kind of guy. I walk in, and the two of them have this puzzled look, and they're trying to figure out how to ask me what I was up to. And I didn't say a word. I got to the door, and just before I opened the door to go to my room, I turned around, and I said, you know, you guys were very wrong. They said, we were wrong, why? I said, you said nothing happens in Edgewood on a Saturday night. Man, there's a lot of stuff goes on down in Edgewood on a Saturday night, and I went to my room, and to this day, those guys are probably scratching their heads. What the hell is that guy up to, you know? You know? And, and, and it's been a gas, it's been a blast. It's, it's, you know, the camaraderie. I walk in the door tonight, and the warmth, and the, the number of people that came up to me and said, I'm so-and-so, how you doing? And I sat there and I said, well, this will be an easy task, you know, giving a talk at an AA meeting, because all you got to do is be boldly honest. And we were talking about that. We were talking about the wonderful part of this program is that we can all get together and tell each other exactly who we are. And we can learn to accept each other for who we are, and we can learn to deal with ourselves for who we are. I don't have to try to be somebody else. I don't have to try to, to impress you when I'm up here. It's, my job isn't to impress you. My job is to uh, share my experience, strength, and hope. Experience, strength, and hope. A little while, about two and a half, I guess it's two and a half years now. No, yeah, maybe. Something like that. I don't know. My wife was diagnosed with stage three melanoma, you know, skin cancer, or stage three. So. We go to the hospital, we go to City of Hope, and they, the doctor says, I got this new program, this new drug, it's trial, it's clinical trials, but we've had tremendous success and everybody's getting fixed from it, you know? I said, good, that's what my wife's gonna get. And we fought the insurance and we went through hell, but we got her in the damn program. And seven months of treatment, two times a month, it was 40 to $300 for a little vial of this crap. But half of it was paid for by the company, uh, uh, Amgen, because they were clinical trials and they paid for the ingredients. And after seven months of treatment, the doctor told her after about six months, the doctor said, you know, Bonnie, um, five years ago I would have told you to get your personal things in order. She goes, but today with this new thing, I, I think uh, a month from now we'll, when we finish the treatment, you'll get a scan and you'll be cancer free. I believe you will be because everybody before you that's had this treatment is cancer free. So she, she, we went for more treatments, and I told her in the beginning, every, and this is AA talking, I said, honey, I don't care about my job, I don't care about anything else. Every time you go to a doctor's visit, you go to that hospital, you go for a treatment, I will be next to you. I swear I'll be next to you. I did, every time, and I went to work and I said, listen, I have to spend time with my wife, she's getting treated for cancer, and, and i got to be honest with you, and I'm going to go and take care of her and, and be with her whenever she needs treatments or anything. If you want me to, if you want me to, I'll, um, I'll retire, and um, if I'm taking too much time off, just let me know, and I'll just retire. They said, no, don't, you can't retire, just take whatever time you need, and as far as we're concerned, if anybody asks, you're working from home, and they covered me, the company was very nice about it, so take care of your wife, that's important. And I did, and then three months, she got, after, the, after a, uh, seven months, she was pronounced cancer free. And then she got a, a, I think it was a three month checkup, and they said, you're cancer free. And two weeks after that, I went in and I said, Mr. Barthes, you, you got your prostate's full of cancer and, and the best thing to do is just to take it out and take out, and they did. They took out my prostate and I'm going to stuff. And the year before, you know, I was putting 100 pounds of weights and a BC on my back and out in Catalina and the Channel Islands and scuba diving and all year before. And who knows what life deals, you know? And they said, Mr. Barkas, we got to take your prostate out. We want to take that out. And no radiation, no nothing. Let's just take the damn thing out. Let's in the process, they took a bunch of lymph nodes out, so my feet swell. And we're driving home. And I said, hey, honey, let's go out for dinner. And she goes, man, you're in a good mood. What's up? I said, two things. I said, number one, I was told I had cancer, but I was also told it's treatable. That's a big plus. 
I said, and number two, I watched you for the last year dealing with your treatments, and you've been a trooper. You never complain. You go in there, you keep a positive attitude, and now you're cancer-free. I said, I want to be like you. Now, that would never come from the old Larry the, to the macho, the drinking guy and all, telling his wife, you've set an example for me to live up to, and I would like to be like you. And, and, and I did, I got the thing, and sure enough, you know, at the end of the surgery, they did a test, and I've just had my 90-day um, checkup and, uh, a couple months ago, and, and I've been cancer-free, you know, three months, six months, nine months, I'm cancer-free. They, they, feel, they feel they got it, you know, and then when, when people see me, they say, Larry, you didn't used to have a walk or a cane and this and that, what's up? And I said, well, it's a combination. My, as I'm getting older, my back is screwed up, and I think I might have to get back surgery. But I said, they took my, my, my lymph nodes, this and that, and they said, oh, I'm sorry. I said, no, 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 no. I don't want to hear the sympathy crap. I go to City of Hope, there's children dying from cancer. There's 30-year-old there's people dying from cancer, you know, and there's people that are, and I said, no, I got it. I just got to work through it in therapy. I was just in therapy this morning, and I just was in physical therapy up at City of Hope, and it's for bladder control. I still got to wear paper underwear and all. That's okay, I'm cancer free, and I'm good, and I'm sober, I'm sober. And that's so important. I'm sober today. It's been, and, you know, June was 27 years that I've hold on, held on to this. And I said to Bonnie, I said, so many of my friends have dropped over the years. And she says, yeah, but you hold that near and dear to your heart, that sobriety stuff. I said, yeah, I said, it's sacred to me. And it's sacred. And it's really blessed to be here tonight. And I love life. And, you know, when you look at me and people that know me say, he's a crazy son of a bitch. And he's always having fun. My son, my kids. Three weeks ago, I did five dives down in Belize. I talked to the, I talked to the dive master. I said, uh, I got this problem. He said, you want to dive? And I said, yeah, I do. And it's not in the United States. They worry about that stuff. They, they, you, go, <laughs> you go to a foreign country, they don't care if you drown, as long as they're getting paid. <laughs> There's no lawsuits. You're not going to sue anybody in Belize. So they put my mask and fins on. I jumped off the boat, and they lowered my BC with the tank and the weights and all of that, and they helped me get it on in the water. And then all I got to do is let the air out, and I'm 50, 60 feet below water, and I'm swimming around. And it was like, oh, back in the water. 15 months I hadn't dove, and I, I love diving, and it's, it's such a, and, and so I'm blessed. What a blessing. And what a blessing to be here tonight. Thanks for letting me share.